As soon as this story starts, the first thing that hits us is this old guy sprawled on the ground, with his face totally smeared with his own blood. And there, standing a little away, is a boy with blue hair, who happens to be the grandson of the man we just spotted. Turns out, the grandfather has been literally cut in half, and that is the grim way his story ends. But when you look back at the boy, it is like he is not even touched by sadness. He even admits that no matter how hard he tries, he just cannot cry. Tears will not come, and he does not feel the sadness you would expect. Despite the fact that his grandpa, who is now in two pieces, was his only family. And with his home up in flames and his grandfather lying dead, the only thing going through his mind is wondering how messed up you have to be to feel absolutely nothing in a moment like this. Let us rewind a bit and check out a moment from the past. So, our blue-haired dude stumbles upon this Arab with a spirit connection, and he is all hyped to spill the beans to his dear old grandpa. Sure enough, the old man gives him a nod of appreciation for his find. The boy spills the beans, saying he searched in the eastern parts just like his grandpa suggested, and that is where he struck gold. The grandpa reveals it is a pretty big deal, and they can fetch at least five nyong for this find. Now, our excited grandson jumps into another discovery, a fox den right next to where he found the herb. But no mama fox, just the little furballs. The mysterious tension descend as the old man, with a serious tone, pops the question, did he off the fox babies? But the boy, innocent as ever, wonders why he would do such a thing. He goes on to explain that it would break the fox mama's heart if she came back to find her little ones wiped out. Grandpa nods in agreement and suggests they park that heavy talk for now and just dive into dinner. But hold up, the grandpa, still using those mysterious vibes, throws a curve ball. He asks his grandson if he can make one promise. Naturally, the boy is curious and shoots back, what is the deal? The grandpa, dropping some serious wisdom, lays it out heavy, revealing that there is a true nature hidden deep within himself. He warns the kid, never reveal it to anyone. Now, the scene takes a sharp turn, and we see the boy with this wicked glint and a devilish grin plastered on his face. He descends, making a beeline for the ground to snatch up a sharp scythe lying there. With the ferocity of a wild animal, he hurls himself towards someone in front of him, unleashing an energy that is downright animalistic. Now, let us shift our gaze to Jingyang County, where the lively streets grab our attention. As we zoom in, it is just another peaceful day with folks bustling around for their daily grind. A cart rolls through the street, its wheels spinning, and as we take a closer look inside, we find a bunch of guys stuck behind bars. These fellas are not your run-of-the-mill thugs, everyone on the street shoots them scornful glances. Apparently, they are petty criminals and mountain bandits. The whole vicinity is buzzing with people yelling and looking down on them, as if they are the main act in a circus. But amid the chaos, there is one person who stands out the most. This individual is being escorted with full-on protocol raising eyebrows and sparking curiosity among onlookers. The onlookers cannot help but question why this guy gets a whole carriage to himself. And would not you know it, this guy turns out to be our blue-haired friend, looking worse for wear, hands cuffed even though he is already behind bars. Now, we see a guy in a straw hat, just casually sipping on his tea, remarks that the young man in the carriage must be around the same age as his young master. Then another guy enters the scene, a bit on the heavier side who chimes in, warning the straw hat not to underestimate the young dude just because of his age. According to him, this guy is probably the worst among all the prisoners. The straw hat, cool as a cucumber, points out that it has been evident from the start, considering the guy gets a whole carriage to himself. While the hefty guy orders himself a drink, he asks the straw hat if he, being a part of the Miram, is not really scared. But then, he drops a bone. The young fella has an enormous kill count with a scythe, that earned him the title of the scythe killer demon. The straw hat, in his laid-back style, brushes it off, calling him just another killer. However, the hefty guy insists it is not something to take lightly. So, changing the subject, Fatty asks the straw hat about the job he has got this time. The straw hat spills the tea, mentioning that he needs to hire someone. Specifically, someone young, someone whose demise would not raise too many eyebrows. Now, things take a darker turn as someone, out of the blue decides to play target practice with the blue-haired guy's head, landing a stone right on his noggin. That leaves the blood gushing out like a crimson waterfall. The stone thrower starts shouting, declaring that this guy deserves more than divine punishment. Meanwhile, the crowd dubs him a parasite and worse. All the while, the straw hat and fatty are peering out from a window in the inn, witnessing the chaotic spectacle below. The poor blue head is now a canvas for his own blood, and the crowd keeps showering him with insults as if he is lower than trash. I mean, at least trash does not get pelted with rocks by random folks. Out of the blue, a chill runs down the straw hat's spine as he locks eyes with the battered blue head for a fleeting second. Then, the blue-haired guy defiantly tilts his head upward, giving off vibes like he could not care less and has zero remorse for whatever dark deeds he is tangled up in. And hey, despite the chaos, it is hard to ignore how handsome he looks, so much so that anyone might mistake him for a pretty woman. Fatty's jaw drops at the sight of the young guy, sharing the sentiment that he is pretty enough to be mistaken for a woman, a guy with such a killer face. The straw hat decides he has had enough, stands up from the table, and bluntly tells Fatty that he does not have any more requests for him. 
It looks like the straw hat has found what he was searching for. As the straw hat exits, he leaves Fatty upstairs, screaming his lungs out, reminding him that he called him here for a job, only to bail out on it now. Finally, the straw hat steps onto the bustling street, and it is evident he has got his eyes locked on the blue head. Apparently, the blue head checks all the boxes for what this mysterious straw hat is seeking. The blue-haired guy, still oblivious inside the carriage, covered in his own blood, has no idea that someone has just picked him for their dark agenda. It is the middle of a starry night, and we find ourselves within the inner castle of Zhangguang County, in the Golden Jade Hall. Within the hall, guards diligently carry out their duties, patrolling the balcony and keeping watch over the castle. Inside one of the prison cells, there is the blue head, confined behind bars and cuffed. A closer look reveals him deep in thought, contemplating something profound. His mind drifts to memories of a mysterious encounter with someone intriguing. Now, Scarface Guy enters the scene, grinning like a maniac. Surprisingly, the blue head finds this character quite impressive. Then, scene transitions, and we meet this mysterious figure sporting a bamboo hat. He is holding onto someone with just one hand, realizing he had been pondering about who was tailing him, only to discover it is some unknown kid. The blue head, faced with this imposing figure, deems him a pure monster. The guy effortlessly holds the blue head by the throat with a single hand, defying gravity like it is no big deal. This is where we learn that this straw hat wearing character is the one responsible for killing the blue head's grandfather. Finally connecting the dots, the boy recognizes this guy as the motherfucker he has been after. However, this formidable adversary outwits him, striking from the shadows, defeating the young guy before he can make a move. He is now grappling with this dire situation, with only one thought dominating his mind, how to take down this formidable foe. He is well aware that if he faces him in a direct fight, the result would be the same as before. Frustration mounts as he cannot seem to figure out a way to kill this dude. The challenge seems insurmountable. Transitioning back to the present, the boy cannot shake off the feeling that he is nothing more than an ordinary, unknown guy. In search of answers, he contemplates whether martial arts could be the key to defeating this guy. Looking around at his current surroundings in this slum, he wonders if he will ever get a second chance to stand up and face his grandfather's killer. Suddenly, wisps of smoke begin to swirl around the scene, triggering immediate alarm in the boy. His mind races, considering the possibility of a fire, but there is no scent of burning, it is a completely different aroma. A mix of herbs he is familiar with, like lizard's tail and purple parsnip, accompanied by the distinctive smell of valerian root. The guards on duty are not immune, they start feeling dizzy out of nowhere, collapsing to their knees. The entire platoon of guards and other prisoners in their cells succumb to the mysterious smoke, falling into a deep, unconscious slumber. The boy, too, begins to feel the effects on his already worn-out body, his eyes involuntarily start closing. The prison door creaks open, and a man strides in with a thudding step. And there, standing in front of the blue head, is none other than the straw hat. Now, the straw hat extends his hand, and like a magic trick gone wrong, the shackles on the boy's feet start shaking and shimmying as if they are at a dance party. But suddenly, the straw hat senses something off. The boy, feigning unconsciousness, is wide awake now, glaring at the straw hat with a gaze that pierces the soul. The straw hat is taken aback to see the boy is alert, and as soon as his feet are free of the shackles, the boy leaps into the air. He makes a run for it, despite his hands still cuffed, leaving the straw hat stuck inside the cell. The boy, not entirely sure what is happening, figures it is his only chance. He managed to stay awake because the scent of the straw hat releases had a bad combination of herbs. But then, out of nowhere, something hits the blue head from behind, leaving him stunned in his tracks. Behind him, fire bullets hit his back. The straw hat finally reveals his face and takes the liberty to speak, claiming he targeted the blue head's pressure points, rendering him unable to move. Now, utterly terrified and stuck in a tight spot, the boy contemplates how this guy caught up to him, wondering if it is some form of martial arts. The mysterious guy hurls a shimmering blue strike at the boy, sending him staggering backward from the sheer force of it. Now, the boy's mind starts racing again, contemplating if this might be the one who killed his grandfather. However, upon closer inspection, he realizes it is not the scar-faced bastard he has been hunting down. They do share a resemblance, but the scar by the left eye is the giveaway. A big shot arrives on the scene, seemingly in charge. He turns to the straw hat, questioning if this is the guy in question. The master strides into the prison, with the straw hat advising his young master to wait outside. However, the master dismisses the suggestion, stating he has never been inside a prison before and always wanted to see it at least once. Disappointingly, he adds that it is not interesting at all and just smells bad. The young master, undeterred by the lackluster prison experience, orders his lackey to fetch a chair and put the little guy down, just so they can have a little heart to heart. Following orders, the straw hat expertly seats our boy, utilizing a less than gentle hair grabbing technique. Finally, the young master decides it is time for a dramatic face reveal, sporting a grin that could probably light up the darkest prison corners. He turns to the straw hat, proudly exclaiming, that we are the exactly the same. Our blue-headed hero, caught in a whirlwind of disbelief, gazes at the young master as if he has just witnessed a cosmic stand-up comedy routine. 
still grinning like he just won the lottery. The young master starts pondering aloud about the unfathomable nature of someone looking exactly like him appearing in this situation. There is a sense of destiny at play. The boy, stuck between a hair-yanking straw hat and a grinning doppelganger enthusiast, can only manage a perplexed look. The young master, still wearing his grin like it is going out of style, casually pops the big question, asking the boy if it is true that he is on death row, set to be drawn and quartered in just two days. Now, the boy displaying a mix of resignation and gentle acceptance, firmly with yes. Then, the master, ever the philosopher, muses on the twisted games fate likes to play. He points out the absurdity that they look exactly alike, yet he is the young master, and the boy is, well, on death row. The boy, fully aware of the harsh reality, stays silent, like a contestant on a grim game show. Breaking the gloom, the master, in an act of unprecedented generosity, decides to throw the boy a bone, offering him a chance. The boy, sensing a potential escape route from the gallows, is all ears. And here comes the grand opportunity. The master proposes that the boy becomes the third young master of the illustrious Great Mock Sword Manor. He is essentially saying, join my squad, and we will sort this mess out together. With a cheeky grin, the master reveals that life in the manor will not be too shabby for our man. He promises delicious food, pretty servants to entertain him, and a comfy bed, all the luxuries the boy never knew he needed. Oh, and a fat stack of cash once the gig is up, so he can finally roam the world as a free man. Once the enticing offer is laid out, the straw hat pulls out a red candy. The master adds a little twist, mentioning that if our boy wants to cash in on this heavenly life, he needs to chow down on this mysterious pill. The boy, eyeing the candy with suspicion, straight up asks if it is poison. The straw hat, not one for beating around the bush, bluntly reminds him that he is just a prisoner and trust is not exactly their strong suit. So, he proposes a deal, eat the poison now, do the job, and get the antidote afterward. Simple, right. Now, the boy, standing on the precipice of freedom, contemplates the opportunity dangling in front of him, in the form of poison, of course. And in a moment of calculated risk, the boy opens his mouth wide, ready for a potentially liberating dose of poison. The straw hat, playing the part of the grim candyman, extends his hand, ready to drop the pill into the boy's eager mouth. It is a risky game, but hey, desperate times call for desperate poison-filled measures. While the boy is bravely gulping down the potentially life-changing candy, we sneak a peek at the master's mischievous grin. Finally, the poison is down the hatch, and the boy has just swallowed a ticket to potential freedom. He turns to the master, a glimmer of hope in his eyes, asking if this dreamlike chance is genuinely within his grasp. The master, grinning like he just won the lottery, assures him with a resounding absolutely. The master directs his lackey to undo the pressure point seal and release the boy from the handcuffs. With a flick of his hand, the fire crackles, and the boy is finally free from the shackles, savoring the first taste of impending freedom. They stride out of the prison camp, moving through corridors where guards are blissfully napping. The straw hat takes the lead, guiding his master and their newfound puppet. The master, feeling quite theatrical, instructs the boy to walk ahead of him, embracing the symbol of newfound authority. As they hit the streets, the straw hat plays the lookout, scanning for prying eyes. After a subtle nod to his master, he signals that it is all clear, and they proceed with caution. As the straw hat turns around, he is met with the sight of the boy gripping his master's head, leaving the once grinning master utterly terrified. The scene shifts, and we witness the master's head expertly turned and placed back by our cunning man. With the stunt successfully pulled off, the boy is now grinning like a manic puppeteer. Reality hits the straw hat like a ton of bricks. Bullets start metaphorically swatting around him, and he is terrified out of his wits. Suddenly, the master drops down with a thud, lifeless on the ground. With a nonchalant expression, our boy, now holding all the cards, casually asks the straw hat what he is going to do about this unfortunate turn of events. After all, he has just put an end to his own cheap copy. Under the bright night sky, chaos reigns supreme in this once peaceful place. And it seems that we have flashed back to the moment where the boy was not arrested yet. Where we see him wreaking havoc on everyone around him because, well, he finds it entertaining. With a scythe in hand, he dashes through the household, slicing and dicing like a chef preparing a salad. Heads roll, and he is having the time of his life, fueled by the adrenaline coursing through his veins. He targets everyone he suspects might be related to his grandfather's death. The emotions he experiences while taking down scores of people are nothing short of pure joy. It is a macabre dance of destruction. Amid the bloodshed, memories of his grandfather flash before his eyes, a reminder to never reveal the true nature hidden within him. But then, in a gruesome display, he severs another head, and blood drips from the scythe. Like a twisted game of bowling, he sends the severed head rolling. Staring at his blood-soaked hands, he contemplates what expression he should wear while ending lives. He questions himself, wondering if he is smiling as he slashes through humans left and right. In this blood-soaked frenzy, he reflects on the true nature his grandfather alluded to, the one he was told to conceal within himself. The line between reality and the shadows of his true self becomes increasingly blurred. Now, he finds himself standing before a desperate figure on the ground, pleading for mercy. The boy, walking towards him, contemplates the eerie thought of whether this is his true nature, whether he is inherently evil. 
deciding to shelve the philosophical musings for another day. He is more inclined to savor the present killing spree. Suddenly, a devastating kick crashes into his ribs, courtesy of the guy in the red draped straw hat. The boy collides with a nearby wall, the impact echoing with a resounding thud, leaving him writhing in pain. The one who was previously crawling on the ground seizes the opportunity and scrambles for safety while the guy in red stands defiantly. Meanwhile, the boy, on the ground, is groaning and coughing, feeling the aftermath of the ruthless kick. A wider grin appears on the martial artist's face as he observes the boy still alive despite the brutal blow. He extends his hand towards his sword, ready to unsheath it. And there is our boy, trembling like a leaf in a hurricane, realizing that he is in for a world of hurt. Bikasu this bastard in front of him giving off pure D-devilish vibes. The straw hat, with a grin, rises the boy to his feet. He is genuinely amused that this sprawled young fella, who probably cannot tell a punch from a picnic, managed to survive his ultimate attack. With a casual grab at the boy's throat, the guy in the straw hat effortlessly lifts him into the air. In the midst of impending doom, the only thing on the boy's mind is how this guy defied the laws of space and time, closing the distance in what felt like a blink. Human or not, it is a question bouncing around the boy's now addled brain. As the straw hat holds the kid aloft, he starts emanating the same eerie vibes the boy felt from the person who dispatched his father. It is like a sinister deja vu. And then it hits the boy, this guy is definitely the one. Before the boy can voice his revelation, the martial artist thrusts his sword into the boy's belly, prompting a violent eruption of blood. It is a gruesome sight, and the boy is left convulsing in agony. The straw hat, unperturbed, withdraws his sword, leaving the boy a mess of pain and despair. It is at this moment that the straw hat is seriously questioning the universe. How on earth did this non-martial artist brat survive his ultimate move? It is almost like the universe is playing a cosmic joke on him. Once again, the straw hat thrusts his sword into the dude's belly, prompting another gruesome display of blood gushing out. In this moment of agony, the straw hat takes the opportunity to school the boy. He explains that if he had not gone around slaughtering folks, he could have lived a quiet life without all these messy consequences. Despite the life lessons being doled out, our man is still stuck on one thing, how he got defeated so easily after finally finding the person who killed his grandfather. He is left pondering if this is the unceremonious end he is destined for. However, as the scene transitions, it becomes clear that this is not how our dude is meant to meet his maker. Sure, he has been sentenced to death, but there is more to the story. Flashing back to the present, he finds himself holding onto the straw hat's master's bent neck, watching as the lifeless body crumples to the ground with a resounding thud. Our man, sporting a wider grin than ever, turns to the straw hat, eagerly asking what his next move will be. It seems the tables have turned, and now our boy is the one pulling the strings. Without wasting a moment, the straw hat seizes the guy by the neck, demanding an explanation for daring to take the life of his young master. He questions whether the boy is prepared to face death. Grinning like a man possessed, our man tosses out some philosophical mumbo-jumbo, claiming that being a stand-in means substituting the real and embracing danger. According to him, blind obedience in such situations is a surefire way to meet the reaper. Unconvinced, the straw hat inquires if the boy is not afraid to die or has never considered the possibility that he might be killed. However, the boy retorts with confidence, asserting that if the straw hat had any intention of killing him, it would have happened already. He bluntly accuses the straw hat of lacking any genuine attachment to his master. Dismissing this as nonsense, the straw hat decides to take matters into his own hands, metaphorically and quite literally. He effortlessly lifts the boy into the air, defying gravity for a brief moment, before forcefully pinning him down on the ground. Unsheathing his dagger, the straw hat is now poised to end the boy's story right then and there. So we are back in the game, and Straw Hat is gearing up, sword in hand, ready to chop off Bluehead's noggin. But get this, facing a one-way ticket to the afterlife, Bluehead's just there, flashing a cheeky grin, and asks Straw Hat if killing him is really necessary. Now, Straw Hat's a bundle of nerves, right? He is still reeling from seeing his master bite the dust, and the whole idea of offing someone does not exactly sit well with him. So, he cannot help but ask why he should let him go. Here's the twist, Bluehead hits him with a gotcha moment, saying he is down to poison pill and the only way he is sticking around is with an antidote. So basically, he is straw hats to command. No wiggle room there. Then, he drops another bombshell, suggesting he could fill the master's shoes, making straw hat the new head honcho with the third young master of the mock sword manor as his loyal lapdog. But straw hat is not totally buying into this whole scheme of turning Bluehead into a puppet and betraying his master's memory. It is all shades of grey and a tad too sketchy for his liking. So, after Bluehead lays down his wild offer, he shoots Straw Hat a look that could probably convince a rock to tap dance. Meanwhile, Straw Hat's still processing the madness that has been thrown at him. Suddenly, the tension on his face disappears, and it looks like he is actually considering Bluehead's bizarre proposal. Just when you think he is all in, Straw Hat swings his blade like he is auditioning for the county's symphony of sword sound effects. Blades collide, echoes resonate, and you are left wondering if this is some intense percussion solo or a scene from a twisted Shakespearean play. 
As the camera zooms in, it becomes apparent that Straw Hat did not actually impale Bluehead's noggin. Nope, the blade's chilling right in front of the guy's eyes, giving him a close shave without the decapitation drama. Finally, Straw Hat casually sheets his dagger and drops the bombshell. Bluehead is now officially Mok Jung Woon. Our boy cannot help but crack a smile because he is one step closer to uncovering the mystery behind his grandpa's demise. So, we have shifted our scene to the Mock Sword Manor, and Straw Hat is laying down the law. He is straight up telling Bluehead that he will not be mingling with the Mock Sword Manor crew anytime soon. Bluehead, ever the quick thinker, points out that it is not much different from being a stand-in. Straw Hat, with that no-nonsense attitude, quickly shuts that idea down. He reminds Bluehead that he is not there to play dress-up but to be a puppet, and there is a big difference. Just to drive the point home, Straw Hat adds a cherry on top. He makes it crystal clear that if Bluehead gets caught doing anything remotely mischievous, he will not be getting any antidote for the poison he chugged down. The boy reluctantly nods in agreement. But wait, there is more. Straw Hat wants to make double sure there will not be any funny business, with a smirk that is probably more charming than it should be. He warns Bluehead that any disobedience or funny business will result in a one-way ticket six feet under. Bluehead, with what seems like a somewhat pleasant smirk of his own, agrees. All right, so Straw Hat, with a mix of irritation and flair, tosses a candy at Bluehead, labeling him a creepy bastard. He declares it as the neutralizer, emphasizing that he needs to take it every 24 hours, or else the poison will throw a wild party all over his body. As the sun begins its ascent, signaling a new journey, we witness Bluehead chugging down the antidote. Now, he is feeling like the luckiest guy alive, surviving stab wounds and getting a second shot at life. He has got this crazy notion that maybe his grandpa is pulling some strings from the heavenly puppetry booth, ensuring Bluehead does not kick the bucket early. Plus, he is not planning on croaking until he avenges his grandpa either. He figures that Mok Jung Woon's corpse has probably been discovered, and decides to play the martial arts game. Hearing rumors about the Mok clan being a martial powerhouse, he figures pretending to be the third young master is his golden ticket. With a sly plan forming in his head, he aims to learn a few martial arts moves for himself. Once he has got the skills, he is dead set on tracking down the motherfucker who offed his grandpa. He is on the trail, and Tad determined to serve the same dish of death to the guy who offed his grandpa. Just the thought of bringing poetic justice to that scumbag puts a pleasant, revenge-fueled smile on his face. It is your typical peaceful day in the household, and there is Blue Head, casually having lunch. But amidst the serenity, he cannot shake off the creepy vibes coming from the guard stationed outside his door. This guard, none other than Go Chan, guard Cam's disciple, is getting on Bluehead's last nerve. The dude is keeping an uncomfortably watchful eye on him, and it is seriously pissing Bluehead off. We catch a glimpse of Go Chan's face, and by the looks of it, he is going through some serious contortions. He is drumming his feet on the ground with anticipation, probably wondering what is so special about this kid who has not even mastered martial arts yet. In a flashback, we glimpse a past moment where Go Chan discovers that Blue Head is the culprit behind Mok Jung Woon's demise. Guard Cam, being the strategist, immediately hushes him, warning him to keep quiet unless he wants the whole manor to overhear. Guard Cam instructs Go Chan to stick to the plan, keep an eye on Blue Head, and ensure he does not escape. Meanwhile, Straw Hat is scheming in the background, working on an alternative plan to deal with the brat. Guard Cam is dead set on getting rid of Blue Head tossing him out like yesterday's leftovers. But for this grand exit to happen, he needs someone on his side. Do Chan, ever the loyal disciple, raises a critical question, reminding Guard Cam of his earlier words. He suggests that if Bluehead is poisoned, it would make it harder for the brat to disobey them. However, Guard Cam bluntly states that Bluehead is not the obedient type. He drops the bomb that Bluehead was once a death row inmate who managed to kill Mok Jung Woon and take his place. Guard Cam sees him as a quick-witted troublemaker, especially considering he was on the brink of death not too long ago. Summing it all up, Guard Cam emphasizes that getting involved with Bluehead is like voluntarily shoving your head into a lion's mouth. So, with this ominous warning, the disciple is left alone, still reeling from the madness. In frustration, he starts banging his head against the door, wondering what makes this seemingly non-martial arts learned. Poison-consuming kid so special. He does not want to go against orders, but the whole situation is driving him up the wall. Meanwhile, inside, Bluehead is having breakfast and growing increasingly annoyed. He cannot help but wonder why Guard Cam did not spill the beans about the need for a stand-in. Instead, he is stuck with one guard keeping a watchful eye on him. Bluehead, being a quick study, has already picked up on the vibes of the place. It does not seem as dangerous as one might think, leaning more towards the safe side. This leads him to the conclusion that Guard Cam must have needed a stand-in for a different, undisclosed reason. As Bluehead goes about his own musings, a sly grin starts etching itself on his face. It is like he has just connected all the dots in a puzzle. He begins to suspect that Guard Cam might be planning to switch sides. While Bluehead is deep in his thoughts, outside, the guard is still standing sentry, and at this point, he is practically dozing off. Suddenly, Bluehead swings the door open, and the guard is jolted awake, practically having a heart attack. Recovering, he turns around, asking if Bluehead needs to use the bathroom or something. 
but the boy denies it, stating that he just wants some fresh air and has a question for the guard. He cheekily asks if the guard would be up for a little walk. However, the disciple is not vibing with this idea at all. With an annoyingly smug attitude, he tells the boy to shut up and get back inside unless he wants to see some blood. Undeterred, Bluehead shoots back with a sly grin, casually mentioning that he thinks the guard's name is Go Chan, and that maybe nothing would happen if they kept their talk a secret between the two of them. The disciple, not willing to take any risks, especially around someone he suspects might be a serial killer, slams him against the door, grabbing him by the collar. He is furious, commanding the boy to remember his place and demanding he get back inside before things get really heated. However, Bluehead, with an intense gaze, coolly remarks that the disciple definitely looks weaker than guard cam. The disciple is left bewildered, and that is when Bluehead places his hand on the guard's shoulder. In a display of ninja-worthy moves he has picked up in the past few days, he effortlessly lifts the disciple into the air. Instantly, the boy tries to neutralize the situation by applying his pressure point technique on the guard. On the other hand, guard's face starts sweating bullets when he realizes his body is not responding. The boy has successfully sealed his pressure points. The disciple is now coming to terms with the fact that this cunning brat had been hiding the fact that he would learn martial arts. With the guard sprawled on the ground, attempting to move his feet but failing miserably, the boy, now standing above him, cheekily asks if maybe he performed the technique wrong. He reveals that he merely copied what guard cam did last time but apparently, it is not as easy as it looks. The guard is losing his composure even more, beads of sweat appearing on his forehead as he grapples with what the hell this kid is saying. He is utterly baffled by the fact that this little troublemaker managed to replicate an entire technique just by witnessing it once. Finally, the realization sinks in, and a devilish image of the boy has been burned into the guard's mind. He reluctantly admits that guard cam was right. This motherfucker is indeed quite dangerous. At this point, the guard is desperate to save his skin by any means, so he goes on threatening and reminds the boy about the poison coursing through his body. He emphasizes that the boy will die if he does not neutralize the poison regularly. Failing to neutralize it will lead to severe consequences, causing him to bleed from all orifices and die a painful death. He further questions if the boy is not going to let him go even when facing death. As soon as the boy remembers the poison in his body, he bites his finger. To mess with the guard, he grabs the guard's disciple's mouth, letting his blood drop into it. Now, the guard is groaning on the ground like a toddler, starting to cough immediately. He quickly begins circulating his inner energy, feeling the need to expel the poison. This is where the boy reveals that he has dealt with all kinds of poisons since he was a kid, foraging for herbs with his grandfather. While kicking the guard down, he discloses that at one point, his blood developed poisonous properties. Now, he starts licking his own blood, and lets the guard know that he can identify herbs just by smelling or tasting them. So, what he is trying to say is most poisons does not work on him. So, he does not need the neutralizer. Now, he gets back to the main business, the burning question in his mind, and pops it, asking the guard about the mock sword manner. To escalate the fear in this already terrified fella, the boy remarks that he is the only one who can neutralize the poison in his blood. He warns the guard to spill the beans, or he will meet his end due to the poison. Transitioning outside the mock sword manor main hall, we find ourselves inside the manor master's room. On the bed lies an old guy, looking pretty ill and coughing. This ailing fellow is Manor Master Mock and Dan. Before him stands his servant, attempting to nurse his master. The servant wonders if there is no solution to the master's sickness. The guy reveals that he has exhausted all his knowledge and experience, using various herbs, but he has not been able to pinpoint the cause of his illness. The mystery deepens as the search for answers continues within the manor. Now, looking at his ailing master, the only thought that crosses the guy's mind is that he should have chosen a master earlier. We learn that there are four sons of the Mock Sword Manor, and the manor master did not name his successor before falling ill. Thanks to that, the state of Mock Sword Manor has become something you had called the silence before the storm. As soon as the master dies, this awkward silence will break, and the brothers will spill blood trying to obtain the position. The first wife is especially fond of the first son, so the old guy has no clue what she will do to secure that position for him. Suddenly, someone sneaks up from behind, catching the old coot off guard. Finally, we see Lady Siok, the manor master's first wife, gracefully standing there, inquiring about the manor master's condition. But the old man remains silent prompting the lady to repeat her words twice. With an off mood, the old man apologizes, mentioning that his knowledge is lacking, and he cannot figure out a treatment. He finds it all very strange. Now, the lady also pretends to feel sad. She responds, mentioning that everyone calls it a mystery illness that they cannot explain, so she figures the only option left is shamanistic arts. But this hits the old man like shocking news. He exclaims in terror, revealing that shamanism is nothing more than a false belief. He goes on to question her intentions, asking how she could resort to such measures. The lady, with a clear hint of malicious intent, shoots back, telling him that she just cannot sit back and do nothing until her husband dies. And just to drive the point home, she flat out says she is done hearing about it. A shaman's on the way, apparently a specialist in mystery illnesses. Despite the old man's desperate pleas, the servants start hauling him out of there. 
the lady spills the beans that this shaman is supposed to work some magic on the manor master's mysterious ailment. She orders her crew to lock down the main hall, and when she says lock down, she means Fort Knox levels, no one gets in, not a soul. Now we are back with the disciple who has spilled all the juicy details about the mock sword manor's current situation. After soaking in the info, the boy casually drops IC. He then decides it is high time to make a move. When the guard wonders where they are headed, the boy tosses the question back, asking what the guard thinks. And then, he drops the bomb, he is going to see the manor master. As they start heading out, it dawns on the boy that the real Mok Jong Woon and guard Gam plan to use him as a stand-in. The idea was to set the firstborn son, Mok Yong Ho, in motion so our boy could do the dirty work and stir up trouble, ending in a kill or be killed scenario. The guard is caught off guard for a moment but admits that it is spot on. Now, we can see him holding onto a paper with a drawing of a man. As the scene zooms out, we get a glimpse of the firstborn, Mok Yong Ho, 20 years old, sporting a birthmark on his left cheek. He is into drinking and womanizing, hitting the tavern almost every other day. He is considered the least capable among the four siblings and carries a greedy and cruel demeanor. Next in line is Mok Yun Pyong, 18 years old. Resembling his mother with sharp eyes, he is known for his cleverness and cunning. Nobody knows what he might do once he becomes the lord of the family. The master plan involves gathering these two siblings in one place, placing a stand-in, and provoking Mok Yoon-pong to kill the fake. After he becomes exhausted from the act, the firstborn, Mok Yong-ho, would backstab him, leading to both of them killing each other. This strategy is aptly named the winning by default plan. In this scenario, regardless of who survives, it ensures that two brothers attempt to kill each other, leading to their elimination as heirs. Once Mok jong woon appears unharmed, he would effortlessly gain the upper hand. However, the plan takes an unexpected turn when the boy twists the master's head 180 degrees and ends his life. The young guard is still puzzled about why the boy is heading to the manor master. The blue head reveals that, based on what he has heard, the life and death of the manor master are intertwined with his own fate, prompting his visit. The servant cautions him about guard Gam's potential anger if he finds out the boy has left. Despite this warning, the boy grins devilishly and assures the guard that he will keep it a secret for him. The guard, internally terrified, exclaims, well, damn, realizing he is in a bind and cannot do much about it. Once again, we find the lady standing gracefully, her attention drawn to someone striding down the path toward her. As the scene zooms in, it becomes evident that this person is a shaman, none other than Shaman Mayo Shin. The lady expresses her trust in Shaman Mayo's reputed miraculous abilities and explains that she decided to give him a chance. Grateful for her trust, Shaman Mayo Shin shares a critical piece of information. The longer the mysterious illness persists, the more the master's condition will deteriorate. He instructs her to ensure that everyone within 30 paces of the main building leaves to avoid bad luck. Then Adai reassures him that she has already taken those measures, and except for the guard protecting the entrance, everyone has left. As the lady starts to leave, and Shaman Mayo Shin proceeds further in, she reminds him not to forget what she instructed him to do, in response she gets all the confirmation she wanted to hear. It is at this point we learn that this old man is on a mission to snag the Manor Master's seal and secret manuals. To sweeten the deal, she throws in an extra 300 silver coins as an incentive if he successfully nabs the goods she is after. With that settled, the lady dismisses the servants and guards, telling them to scram until further notice. After that, she also takes her leave, pondering the idea of not buying into something as unsettling as shamanism. While mulling this over, she spots someone in the distance, setting off a few alarm bells in her head. This guy is Mok Yuchen, shirtless and working up a sweat, and his jacked-up body is a clear indication of his dedication and hard work. However, in the eyes of the first wife, this guy is just a lowly offspring of a Jaisha. Frustrated, she turns on her heel and starts walking in the opposite direction. She is okay if her firstborn does not snag the position, but she cannot stomach the manor master handing it to this guy with lowly blood. As she storms away, her attention is once again snagged by something unexpected. But this time, it is our boy, strutting confidently in his own direction. The boy also catches wind of someone's presence and turns around to see who is there. So, while the boy is checking out Mr. Mystery Sweat a lot, the guard spills the beans that he is the fourth son, apparently diving deep into martial arts. The kid's mind starts doing somersaults, watching this dude with mad martial skills, a strong work ethic, and a vibe that screams Manor Master's favorite. After sizing him up, the young one shoots a casual question at his guard, wondering if this is some legit way to learn martial arts. The guard's quick on the draw, explaining the guy's using horse steps to power up his lower body. You know, the foundation for all things martial arts. Armed with this new nugget about the martial arts world, the kid just goes, I see. Now, here comes the kicker. He drops the bomb, asking if he could take down guard cam with same martial arts mojo. At this point, the guard behind him is left frozen, and no words come out of his mouth. So, the kid throws the question again, making it crystal clear, can he, armed with martial arts skills, beat guard cam? Now, this poor guy, just trying to do his guard duty without getting into maniacal discussions, starts sweating bullets. He is left wondering if the kids onto their plan that guard cam want to kill and abandon him. 
I mean, the guard knew that this kid is really clever, but this is a whole new level of crazy. So, summoning up some guts, he swallows hard and spills that the basics of martial arts dive into internal training. The boy, intrigued, shoots back, what is internal training then? The guard spills the beans, revealing it is all about this internal breathing technique. A person uses two gunane to purify nature energy inside them, and gather inner ki, and then, they get stronger. But hold on, the guard spills some more talk that accumulating inner ki is no walk in the park. Even if someone learned martial arts, it is going to be a tough cookie to beat a first-class martial artist like Guard Cam. It is because he got 30 years more of inner key under his belt, not to mention his techniques top-notch. So, the boy is connecting the dots, thinking this will not be a walk in the park in a short period, and to which, the guard just nods with a solid yes. But that guard's smug smirk clearly tells that he has got a secret stash of mischief. And when we sneak a peek into his noggin, turns out, he straight up lied. Because, in reality, the boy probably could not pull it off even if he had a gazillion lifetimes. It is a time thing. Internal training kicks off when you are a wee lad, around 5 minus 9 years old. Miss that boat, and you are pretty much stuck. The energy piles up, and no matter how hard you try, gathering that inner key becomes a Herculean task. Basically, this dude's inner key gathering machine is on permanent vacation. The guard's probably having a laugh, watching this poor soul sweat it out for something he can never achieve. Then, out of the blue, the boy turns to the guard, eyes cold enough to freeze hell over. He casually slides his hand near the guard's eyes, and with a tone as chilly as the arctic, he lets it drop, his eyes may look greedy, but they are also game for a bit of eye-poking action. And just like that, the guard's probably left rethinking his life choices. The boy's mood takes a wild U-turn. Instead of eye-poking doom, he extends his hand towards the guard, recruiting him as his personal bodyguard. The guard, probably still recovering from the heart-thumping encounter, hesitates for a beat. But then, realizing this might be the better end of the deal, so he reluctantly agrees to his new role. Seems like Bluehead here has bought into the guard's narrative. Now, the mission is clear, killing guard cam is a no-go, so the next best move is to bring him to their side. But hold your horses, it is not all sunshine and rainbows, because guard cam's got trust issues, and convincing him to switch sides is like trying to teach a cat to do backflips. Suddenly, the guard decides it is time to hit the road pronto. Naturally, the kid is all confused so he asks why they are rushing out. And here's where it gets spicy. The guard spills the tea about the fourth master hating on the real youngest master. The kid, always the curious one, asks about the reason behind that. Then, the guard unleashes the bombshell. Two years back, the real youngest master dropped a bomb on the youngest's mom, calling her a vulgar name, and that resulted in a proper beatdown. Now, the kid does not react like you would expect. Instead of joining the pity party, he starts laughing like it is the funniest thing he has heard all year. Confused guard is now even more confused, and starts demanding an explanation. The kid, still chuckling, asks if it is true that the youngest master's limbs are all still intact. Awkward silence follows, and it is pretty much a confirmation. Guard's lips are sealed tighter than a pickle jar. Now, our not-so-chill guard suggests they make a run for it before they find themselves swimming in hot water. Now, as our dynamic duo makes their sneaky exit, let us take a moment to appreciate this hardworking fella. Seriously, where does he get all that willpower? I need some of that mojo in my life. Anyway, it seems the sun decides it is time to call it a day, casting that golden hue over everything. Inside the grand hall and corridor, the lamps are already doing their thing, lighting up the place like a fancy movie set. As we venture deeper into the house, we spot some silver coins hanging on a thread, just casually dangling there like they own the place. But wait, there is more. Zoom out, and we catch sight of an old shaman attempting some black magic voodoo on the sick old master. Cue the mysterious vibes. The poor old master's body is going pale, and after taking a closer look at it, the shaman spills the beans, revealing that what everyone thought was just an addiction is actually some next-level murderous energy. We are talking about the kind of energy that would have turned a regular Joe into a crispy critter ages ago. But nope, this old master is no ordinary chap. He is a martial artist, enduring this deadly energy like a champ. Now, the shaman decides to drop a truth bomb. It has been too darn long with this murderous energy lingering around him. The survival odds are hanging by a thread, flirting with a solid 50-50 chance. Anyway, this old shaman is all about business. He is just here to do his mystical gig and could not care less about where he hangs his hat. So, after laying out his mystical paraphernalia on the ground, he whips out a paintbrush, grabs a yellow clear sheet, and starts jotting down some dark magic mumbo-jumbo. Once he is done, he hurls the talisman towards the old master and starts chanting, stating that he vowed to teach them the dharma and to help them escape from suffering. The talisman makes contact, hitting the exact spot where the funky energy is lingering. Suddenly, there is a bright yellow light, shimmering like a disco ball. The old man throws up some hand signs, and a light starts dancing in his palms. He starts spouting the same magical nonsense again, shifting his hand gestures and adding more enchanting words. Finally, he triggers a reaction, making the master groan in pain. At this point, the old man's really struggling because the energy he is dealing with is no joke, but did not give up. 
he keeps on with the magical mumbo jumbo. And out of the blue, the master's eyes start shimmering in red. Suddenly, the creaking door behind the old guy sends shivers down his spine. Now, he is sweating bullets, worried that someone might barge in, and if his magical shenanigans get interrupted, consequences are gonna rain down. Out of nowhere, a purple energy starts oozing out of the Grand Master's body. The old guy, in full panic mode, scrambles back, tumbling on the ground. Just as the old man turns around, there stands the young master, who lets out a frustrated call asking what is this bullshit. The guard, in absolute shock to see his manor master entangled in this bizarre mess, watches as the young master strolls towards them. With a sly grin, the young master greets his ailing father. The guard, catching his wits, follows suit and strides toward the young master, leaving the bewildered shaman scratching his head, wondering what the fuck is going on. Now, the boy positions himself right in front of his moaning, pain-ridden father. Flashing a warm, pleasant smile, he extends his heartfelt greetings to his old man. But here's the twist. The shaman loses it, screaming his lungs out, demanding they all get the heck out of there. His shouts echo through the entire manor. He does not care if the boy is his son or whatever, he just wants everyone gone ass a pee. The guard, not taking this lightly, fires back, questioning the old man's authority to kick them out while they are in the middle of their chat. Meanwhile, the young master is tactfully scrutinizing his father. The old man starts jabbering again, explaining that their efforts to counter the mysterious illness have gone down the drain because of the murderous energy. And this murderous energy is about to make things worse. The guard, clearly confused after hearing this nonsense, straight up asks if the old man is some sort of alchemist or something. It is at this point that the old man has started begging, urging them to please evacuate before things spiral even more out of control. Looks like this old guy has stumbled into a supernatural family drama that is way beyond the usual pay grade. Out of the blue, a distinct gulp echoes through the room, as if someone just swallowed something hefty. The boy locks eyes with his father, mouth wide open, groaning in agony. It is like a light bulb flickers on in the boy's head, and he figures something out. Out of nowhere, the young master decides to defy gravity, going all David Blaine on everyone. The old alchemist is probably regretting not going into a more stable career, like accounting. Panicking, the old man orders the young guns to help hold the master down so he does not break loose. Dumbfounded, the duo has no choice but to follow the old man. After all, they did not get their PhD in dealing with this supernatural mess. Sure enough, they grab the master, restricting his movements while the old man, once again armed with his talisman, gets into some magical shenanigans. The purple energy levels skyrocket, making your Wi-Fi issues seem like a minor inconvenience. Out of nowhere, the Grand Master pulls a superhero move, grabbing the guard's hand like he is about to teach him the ultimate secret handshake. In the blink of an eye, the Master Hulk smashes the poor guard's hand into a gazillion pieces, like a plate meeting its demise. Now, the poor guard is writhing in intense pain, tears streaming down his face, and his screams could rival a donkey's. Finally, they manage to lay the Master back on his bed. But here's the kicker, he is still holding onto the guard's hand. And just to spice up the already nerve-wracking situation, the old guy drops the bomb that the master has somehow leveled up in strength. Now, cue the horror movie vibes, as some parasitic creature starts making its way up the master's hand, aiming straight for the terrified guard. Dude's practically having an existential crisis, wondering if this illness is about to turn him into a horror movie extra. The parasite is just inches away from the whimpering guard. At this point, he is regretting more than just choosing this job. It has become a full-on regret-your-life choices scenario. Last in no time, the master whips out a sword like he is the hero of the story, slashing down the grand master's hand before the parasite can make its move. The terrified fella is finally free from the master's death grip, probably contemplating a career change at this point. Blood is doing the cha-cha, splashing everywhere, and even the old man cannot help but gawk in horror at the gruesome spectacle. The boy, spotting the parasite heading for his father's mouth again, grins like he is preparing for the second round of the arm-cutting Olympics, leaving the guard, utterly baffled, who is wondering if this is a family tradition or something. Sure enough, the boy goes for another slice of his old man's hand, and the blood becomes the star of its own splatter movie. The guard, now in full gawk mode, is witnessing this guy cutting down his master's hand like it is just a regular Tuesday. The master's hand is now on the ground, still wriggling, while the parasite clings on for dear life. But to bring this parasite saga to an end, the old guy whips out his trusty talisman, slaps it on the affected hand like it is a magical band-aid. Meanwhile, the guard, in an attempt to prevent his master from bleeding out, decides to play impromptu nurse and covers the wounded hand. Now, the old man is in full panic mode, realizing he messed up big time. The manor master's lost an arm, and he is ready to skedaddle from the scene before anyone points a finger at him. Just when the old man thinks he is in the clear, a shiny blade appears out of nowhere, practically giving him a close shave. With a pitiful attempt to make a comeback, the old man blurts out asking, what is the meaning of this? The guard, eager to jump in and spill the beans, gets a swift finger gesture from the boy, effectively silencing him. The boy, calm as a cucumber, starts grilling the old man. 
The first thing he asks is if is this the reason the manor master turned into a one-armed wonder. The old man, however playing it cool, explains that it is all about the parasite thing taking over the master's body. And, hey, it is not over yet, he might just kick the bucket. The old man throws in a casual warning stating that he might want to put that sword away unless he also want the grand master dead. In a classic slip of the tongue moment, the old man accidentally drops an also bomb, realizing he is now in a heap of trouble. The boy, ever the detective, wants to know who else had a ticket to the manor master losing an armed show. With a stern gaze, the boy straight up asks if the person who hired him was behind this mess. The old man, trying to backpedal faster than a unicyclist on a tightrope, denies everything, claiming it is all a massive misunderstanding. But our boy is not one for beating around the bush. He inches his blade even closer to the old man's throat, making it crystal clear that honesty is the only currency that'll stop the sword from making a closer acquaintance. Realizing he is cornered, the old man spills the beans like a clumsy chef dropping spaghetti all over the kitchen. According to him, the first lady casually suggested that sparing the manor master's life was not necessary. She gave him a special mission, locate the secret manual and the manor master's seal using some evil spirit mojo. Now, the boy, seemingly unaware of this sinister plan, dives into the details of the secret manual and the manor master's seal. Meanwhile, the guard, connecting the dots faster than a constellation expert, realizes that if they had not intervened, the first son would have smoothly taken over as the manor master. Now, the guard shifts his attention to the young boy, stressing the urgency of saving the manor master or facing the risk of the first lady ordering a hit on him. The boy, connecting the dots like a supernatural detective, starts unraveling the first lady's nefarious plans. Sensing imminent doom, the old man quickly pledges that he can save the manor master at any cost, trying to avoid an express ticket to hell. The boy, signaling with his sword, gives the green light for the old man to proceed. But hold on, he is not talking about saving the old master. His main interest lies in extracting the juicy details about the secret manual and the seal. Both the guard and the old man are left utterly dumbfounded by the twisted priorities of this son. But, the old man warns that any interference could put the manor master in serious jeopardy. But the boy, ever the no-nonsense type, bluntly tells him to just get down to business. Amidst the glow of lamps on the ceiling, the old man gets back to his spooky business, playing with a peculiar doll. Naturally curious, the guy next to him cannot resist asking about the creepy doll's purpose. The old man spills the beans, it is a vessel. And here's the twist, if the manor master comes into contact with the evil spirit again, he might kick the bucket. So, he is planning to link this doll to the manor master, pulling off some woogie doll magic. With a dose of dark magic nonsense, he sets the stage. Meanwhile, the persistent parasite is reaching out for the string, and a new hand emerges from the severed hand of the manor master, snatching the doll in its grasp. The manor master, not enjoying the encore, starts shrieking at the top of his lungs, tortured by the bizarre spectacle. As the two goons watch the eerie show unfold, the cursed hand gets to work, smashing the doll with bare hands. The old man, now sweating bullets, knows that if the murderous energy is too potent, forcing things further could unleash the evil spirit. Right now, the old man finds himself in a real pickle because this little troublemaker would never listen to him. But just when he thought it is game over for him, a bright idea sparks in the old man's mind, and a broad grin starts to etch on his face. Out of nowhere, the old man claims he will now restrict the evil spirit, but he wants the guard to wait outside. Sure enough, the guard starts to walk out, but he cannot shake off the eerie vibe this old coot is exuding. Now that the guard is gone, the old coot decides to kick off his magic show once again. He starts channeling energy, and a bright aura begins to shimmer in his hands while the master continues to groan in pain. The pain intensifies, and the master's eyes shimmer with a bluish energy. The old man, in full magical mode, keeps chanting, let the effects of this ritual be manifested in haste, and heed his questions, over and over again. The boy watches, still concerned, as the old man pulls out all the stops. The old man continues spouting even more of this magical nonsense, weaving his mystical incantations. Miraculously, the master starts to calm down, and it seems like the ritual is actually working. Hope flickers in their eyes. But then, out of nowhere, the hand gripping the doll intensifies its grip, distorting and deforming. More hand-like apparitions start emerging from it, and the situation takes a supernatural turn for the worse. Now, the old man is losing his composure again because this cursed entity seems hell-bent on taking over the entire body of the master. But then, in a heroic move, the boy steps in. With a swift flick of his sword, he cuts the thread like it is no big deal, and the creature falls to the ground. However, the drama does not end there, it decides to take a detour, and lunges toward the boy. In the blink of an eye, the hand grabs hold of the boy's entire leg, threatening to crawl into his entire body. Faster than you can say supernatural surprise, these hands start crawling all over him, while the old man is grinning like he just hit the jackpot. It dawns on us that this was the old bastard's plan all along. The parasite covers the boy entirely from head to toe, leaving only his eyes, which are intensely gazing at this old bastard. Seizing the opportunity, the old man instantly places the same talisman on the boy's head, and at the same time, the wooden doll cracks into a hundred pieces. 
peeking into his mind. We learn that it was an evil spirit from the beginning, seething with a strong killing intent. It was just a matter of time before it broke free from control. The old man feels quite fortunate that the evil spirit transferred to the boy. Grinning like a maniac, he revels in the success of completing the mission, getting rid of the obstacle. Not to mention, he now has someone to pin all these trivial matters and blames on. This unsuspecting young guy. It is a diabolical twist, and the old man is playing his cards with eerie precision. Now, when we take a closer look at the boy, he appears unconscious from the outside. But inside, he is grappling with this tardy, poisonous motherfucker who snuck inside his body. In his mind, this curse is fuming with anger because of the attempted deception with the puppet, and he is not forgiving anyone for that. Now, our boy is unconscious, and looking at him, this virus starts to wonder if this is the one who deceived him. But now, this virus is quite pleased to have found a young guy's body. Right now, he wants it all for himself, and he plans to keep the boy trapped in his own mind forever, in slumber. While the boy is trapped within his own mind, he drifts back into his memory lane, finding himself wandering alone in a jungle, searching for some good herbs. The scene around him is breathtaking, to say the least. As he starts to remember, he realizes that this place is the watering hole he always visits in this peaceful mountain. Birds are chilling around, and the sounds of flowing waters echo, making the scene even more calming and pleasing to everyone's ears. The boy looks in every direction, knowing this place well, as it is somewhere he always visits and could never forget. He pours some water into his basket and starts walking out of this beautiful place. However, he cannot shake the feeling that today is a bit strange. He wonders about this strange feeling, as if he is missing something or forgetting something. Suddenly, his attention is captured by an intensifying fire near the mountains. Shockingly, he realizes that the fire is coming from the direction of his house. His water basket falls to the ground, and he starts sprinting, passing the mountains with incredible speed. The tranquility of the jungle is replaced by a sense of urgency and dread. His facial muscles tense up, and there is only one thing on his mind, hoping his grandfather is okay. He runs as fast as possible, finally emerging from the jungle while shouting for his grandfather. As he approaches his residence, he is left utterly terrified because before him, his grandfather lies literally cut in half. He grabs hold of his grandfather and desperately calls out to him to wake up, but it is a futile effort. The old man is already dead. He is left wondering who could have done this to his grandfather, unable to comprehend how his beloved grandparent has been taken from him. In this moment, he realizes just how precious a part of his life his grandfather was. Now, all he can do is cry, his tear glands depleted while holding on to his grandfather's lifeless, half-body. It is a heart-wrenching scene that leaves him shattered and grieving for the loss of someone dear to him. While he is going through this turmoil, someone appears behind him, the same virus that had polluted our boy's mind from the inside out. He finally recognizes what this despair-drenched entity truly desires. The virus extends his hand, and purple energy starts to appear on his palm. Something purple enters the boy's ears, and instantly, a voice starts speaking into his mind, asking him what he is doing over there. Suddenly, he finds himself once again seeing his grandfather out of nowhere. His grandpa asks him if he is going to daydream sitting there or if he is actually going to lend a helping hand. The boy is utterly bewildered to see his grandfather before his eyes. Taking a closer look, it is clear that the boy is not in his sober senses, caught in the intersection of reality and the illusions crafted by the virus. Out of the blue, the kid wraps his arms around Grandpa like he is hugging the secret to everlasting happiness. The old man is left utterly bewildered by this unexpected hug. He then tells his grandson that if he wants to make this old man fall over and asks why he is getting so cozy all of a sudden. However, the boy remains silent, not wanting to lose his grandfather again. His grandfather is the reason someone who should have died is still alive. Meanwhile, the virus is watching with satisfaction as the boy gets cozy with his grandfather. This is exactly what the virus wanted, for the boy to lose himself in his subconscious mind, living an ordinary life with his precious grandfather. The virus desires the boy to keep living in the past memories, experiencing endless happiness. The virus's plan is to make the boy stay with his grandfather forever, trapped in an endless loop of unconscious existence. Just when the virus thinks it has got the boy on puppet strings, the kid shoots at this look. No words, just a stare that sends shivers down the virus's spine. And then, out of nowhere, the kid pounces on the virus, grabbing its face. That is the moment the virus realizes it is in way over its digital head. The boy, with a vice grip on the virus's face, expresses his gratitude for bringing back some unpleasant memories he would rather not relive. While our blue-headed hero tightens his hold, the virus's digital brain is in a frenzy, trying to compute how this is even happening. The boy straight up tells the virus that watching it mess around with memories of his departed dad is downright annoying. The threat is crystal clear. He is on the brink of turning that diary smug into pixelated mush. Before going for the final blow, the boy pauses and with a gaze as cold and calculating as the darkest abyss, he corrects the virus on a crucial misunderstanding. 
He clarifies that if the virus truly wanted to manipulate his desires for happiness or vengeance, it missed the mark entirely by resurrecting images of his deceased grandfather. With a voice dripping venom, he states that a far more compelling scene would have been to confront the murderer of his grandfather, where he would have unhesitatingly torn the culprit to shreds. At this revelation, even the virus, this digital incarnation of death itself, starts to tremble with the existential dread of its impending doom. It is completely taken aback, its core programming struggling to comprehend the sheer depth of malice and primal desire for vengeance that festers within the boy's psyche. A terrifying realization dawns on it. The boy harbors a darkness so profound, so filled with lethal intent, that it surpasses the fear any spirit, alive or dead, would dare confront. In the midst of his righteous fury, the boy is momentarily taken aback as his grandfather's voice reaches out to him, threading through the chaos with a memory of his name's origin. The grandfather reveals that he named the boy with the hope that he would grow up to embody kindness and righteousness, choosing a name that symbolized the path of integrity. This revelation serves as a poignant reminder of the values his grandfather wished for him to uphold, urging him to grow into a person of virtue, not straying from the path of righteousness. With these parting words echoing in his mind, the boy's resolve is momentarily softened, reminded of the legacy his grandfather wished for him to carry forward. However, the immediate threat before him snaps his focus back to the senses. The parasitic entity, now engulfed in fear, frantically seeks an escape from the boy's wrath, aware of the impending doom that awaits it. As the entity scrambles to flee into the recesses of the boy's consciousness, hoping to evade capture or destruction, the boy gives chase with unyielding determination. Brandishing a scythe, he becomes a relentless pursuer, his presence looming like a reaper over the terrified parasite. As the parasite steps within the lush, vibrant landscape that embodies the boy's deeper consciousness, it is momentarily caught off guard by the serenity and beauty that surround it. The stark contrast between the chaos of their earlier confrontation and the peacefulness of this inner sanctum is jarring. Standing under the vast, shimmering sky, surrounded by an endless expanse of greenery, the creature encounters a mysterious gate, an anomaly in this otherwise idyllic setting. The presence of the yellow seal on the gate piques the parasite's curiosity. This seal, identical to the one used by the old man earlier, suggests that the boy's memories or perhaps certain aspects of his psyche are deliberately sealed away, hidden behind this gate. The creature, despite its malicious intent, is forced to pause and consider the significance of this seal. So, this parasite thought it was about to take a joyride through the boy's mind. It sees this door, thinks it has hit the jackpot to taking over. But the door turns into this creepy mist, and suddenly, it is not looking so good for this little intruder. Everything nice and green turns all spooky and eerie fast. The dark vibes start creeping up on the parasite, and he is left scratching his head as what is happening. The boy flips the script on this unwelcome guest. Instead of the parasite taking over, the boy makes it clear that he is in charge here, and starts to absorb this dude instead. The parasite, which was all smug a minute ago, is now freaking out, realizing it bit off more than it could chew. In a total panic, it tries to bail, but nope, the boy's got this. He is like the boss in his own head, showing this parasite who is really in control. And just like that, with what is probably the weirdest gulp moment ever, the boy just swallows the parasite's essence or whatever, effectively making it game over for the baddie. So, after that whole mind battle royale, where the boy basically gulps down the parasite like some sort of mystical snack, things take a turn for the epic. The boy starts ejecting this crazy purple energy from his body, leaving the shaman guy staring in total shock. Like, he is legit wondering what kind of wild show he just stumbled into. But the boy is not just okay. He is standing up like he is ready for round two, with all this sinister energy swirling around his hand. It is as if he has got a whole new level of power, and there is this vibe that he is not alone in there anymore. As the camera pans out, we see this super buff, dark, and mysterious figure standing right there with him, looking like he has got nothing but respect for the boy. The boy then coolly refers to this formidable figure as Demonic Monk, which sounds like the kind of ally you definitely want on your side. Outside in the quiet embrace of the night, a solitary figure sits on the stairs, wrapped in the cloak of his thoughts. This is Jang Myongan of the Mock Sword Manor, a man whose demeanor tonight is one of contemplation and unease. As the camera zooms in on him, his story starts to unfold, revealing a connection to the manor master Mock and Dan that spans nearly two decades. Myongan, known in his prime as a martial artist of some renown, especially during the time they fought side by side against pirates, holds a deep respect for Mock and Dan. Together, they face dangers and adversaries, forging a bond not just in battle but in spirit. The victory over the pirates not only cemented their legacy, but also led Nyongan to become the inner manor master, where he swore loyalty to manor master and Dan. But now, as he sits in the dark, a shadow of doubt crosses his mind. He is struggling with the recent decision made by the manor master, the choice to appoint what he sees as a lowly child to the prestigious position of the manor's next master. To Myongan, this decision does not sit right. 
he cannot help but wonder how Mockandan, a man he has looked up to as a true hero and a paragon of virtue, could make what he perceives to be such a misguided choice. And it seems the reason he is not feeling this idea which is kinda connected to the first wife of the manor master. She kinda planted this whole thing in the inner manor master's head, saying that a lowly kid is not fit to be the manor master of Mock Sword Manor. She convinced him it is for the future of the manor and told him to kick everyone out until the shaman uses some shamanism to find a seal and a secret manual. Now, he is just sitting there sulking because, for the sake of peace in Mock Sword Manor, he promised to go along with it. But now, it is really bothering him, and he is dead sure the shaman is a fraud. He thinks they might use some weird medicine to threaten the manor master. Finally, he decides to stand up and put an end to it. After all, it goes against the loyalty pledge he made to the manor lord. So, he starts striding toward the manor master, just to check real quick and come back. Back inside the chaos, the old coot is sweating bullets as he realizes he is dealing with more than your average vengeful spirit. It is a high-class evil spirit, a real VIP in the spirit realm. The boy, sporting a pleasant smile like he is ordering takeout, decides it is time to send in the demonic monk for some ghost-busting action. With a casual flick of the finger, the boy commands the spirit to go play tag with the shaman. The demonic monk, following orders like a spectral butler, lunges at the terrified old man. Now, this old coot might look like he is about to meet his ghostly match, but he has got a trick or two tucked up his sleeve. Just as the demon's fist is ready to party on the old man's face, our wrinkled magician conjures up an energy field. As the two forces clash, the old man is left bewildered. How on earth did this kid manage to boss around an evil spirit? The old coot is stuck in a loop of confusion, trying to process the fact that he is playing tug-of-war with a vengeful spirit that actually follows orders. With a triumphant surge, the spirit overpowers the struggling shaman, sending him crashing to the ground. However, this is not the end of the story. The old man, resilient as ever, gets back on his knees, facing the creepy motherfucker who has got a taste for shaman snacks. With a mix of fear and desperation, he begs the spirit to keep its distance. But, it seems that the spirit does not take orders from anyone else. So, it disregards all the shaman's pleas, and lunges at him with hunger in its ghostly eyes. Suddenly, it is a hands-on party, as hundreds of ghostly hands reach out from the spirit his mouth, eager to savor the old man's soul stew. The terrified shaman, caught in a spectral mosh pit, screams and pleads for mercy, even offering to do anything to spare his life. But the, the boy, not one for negotiations, bluntly refuses. As the hands tighten their grip, the old man, facing the inevitable, even questions if it is because he tricked the boy. However, the boy, with a dark and resolute demeanor, corrects him. It is not about the trickery, it is about what the old man knows about the whole seals and secret manuals shebang. Amidst the ghastly spectacle, the old shaman, in a desperate bid to resist the relentless pull of the ghostly hands, finds himself shedding tears. His futile attempts to cling to the floor are in vain, and even his fingernails begin to bleed as the relentless hands drag him closer to his spectral demise. In this harrowing moment, the shaman has an epiphany, this demonic encounter was no accident. The boy had orchestrated his demise from the very beginning. With the shaman on the brink of becoming an otherworldly snack, the boy signals the guard outside to join the macabre scene. As soon as the guard enters the scene he is met with this grisly sight of the old man sprawled on the ground, bathed in his own blood. He then inquires if the shaman is dead, but the boy instructs him to save his questions for later and orders him to carry away the shaman's lifeless corpse. Now, the boy after picking up his sword starts swinging it around like he is in a medieval rave party, smashing everything in sight. And get this, his plan is to blame the whole mess on the shaman. He has concocted this wild story where the shaman goes bonkers and chops off the manor lord's arms, and they heroically step in to stop the madness. The guard, probably wondering if he is in some twisted comedy show, follows orders with a blank expression. He is worried that the manor mistress will not buy into their little charade and might start asking some serious questions. After all, a half-baked cover-up job could make things even worse. The boy is really pushing the boundaries of believability with this twisted plot. The guard then points out that even if they somehow sell this story of the shaman going berserk, the manor mistress will not just swallow it without skepticism. But no worries, our inventive boy decides to kick it up a notch. He prepares his sword and casually stabs his own leg, throws the blood-soaked sword on the ground, and adds a juicy twist to the tail. The shaman not only attacked the manor lord but also tried to off the young master. The guard, now completely flabbergasted, is left wondering if they have entered a realm of madness where reality and fiction are having a questionable rendezvous. Now, the boy shoots back at the guard, asking if the story seems even more believable now. The guard, still scratching his head, cannot wrap his mind around the idea that this kid went overboard, stabbing his own leg just to cover things up. It is scary, no doubt, but the scary part does not even begin to cover it, it is downright horrifying. Anyway, he starts taking steps to stop the bleeding, but the boy tells him to chill because it will be easier to convince them if his face is pale. While they are at it, the inner manor master unexpectedly shows up. The guard is left utterly bewildered by the unexpected arrival, and the inner master is shocked out of his wits to see the place in shambles. There, the manor master lies on the bed, and the old shaman sits right before him. The guard starts losing his cool, witnessing the chaos they have caused. 
But then, both the boy and the guard start raising their voices with concern, insisting it is a huge misunderstanding. The boy, with his trembling feet, urges the inner master to take a look at the manor master before jumping to conclusions. But then, the boy collapses on the ground due to the exhaustion from blood running down his leg. The inner master starts shouting at the top of his lungs at the guard, demanding to know exactly what just happened and why the third young master is here. But just before the inner master speaks, he takes a worried glance at the boy on the ground, only to discover that this guy is grinning like a maniac even in the face of death. It dawns on him, it is all an act. Now, we are outside Mock Sword Manor's medicine hall. Inside, the hall is filled with random herbs laid down in baskets, and shelves holding countless more herbs and medicines. Our boy, with his leg all patched up, is lying on a bed, having the time of his life. He is quite enjoying the herbal aroma in the room. While casually chillaxing, he smiles because he has finally discovered the whereabouts of the manuals and seals of the manor master. They are in the basement, tucked behind the stone doors. Now, he is planning to take a look around at night when there are not many people around. Then, the guard arrives, his hand also patched up. The boy reminds him that he is late, but the guard, fuming, puts his hand under his gown and pulls out two books that were in the shaman's possession. The boy asks if he found anything else other than the books. The guard explains that he barely managed to get these two out before everything else was burned to ashes. The boy, intrigued by the burning revelation, asks what exactly they are burning. The guard spills the beans, explaining that they are torching all the items the shaman brought, probably trying to erase any evidence. As the boy takes a look at the books, he finds himself a bit disappointed. One is Master Chu's summary and the original book of the Ying Yang school, and the other is the first tome of Anomaly. Regardless, he praises the guard for his efforts. While the guard is still standing there, the boy asks if he has anything to add. The guard says no and mentions that he was just curious about for what he wanted those books for. Then, the boy points his finger out of the window and asks the guard what he sees outside. The guard is bewildered because he cannot spot anything noteworthy, so he says nothing. Little does he know, there is a creepy guy hanging around just outside the window, waiting for the boy's command to move. The boy mentions that this is the only thing I want to figure out, but the guard, not on the same wavelength, asks what he is talking about. Out of the blue, someone shows up at the doorsteps, grabbing both their attention. There is a silhouette of two people, and the first wife seems to be trying to force her way into the nursery. But the guard outside informs her that the young master is still recovering. But, she does not care and barges in, skipping all the pleasantries. She gets straight to the point, and tells the boy to let us have a little heart to heart. Things just got real, and it looks like we are in for some serious talk. To find out the contents of this conversation, stay tuned until the next episode. For now, we have already caught up with the latest chapters, and I assure you the story is only going to get better from now on. Stay strapped to your seats, and I'll see you guys very soon. Until next time.